So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the first session of the day, Fireside Chat, Innovation Across Borders. And here to moderate, we have the Yardi Senior Regional Director for APAC, Bernie Devine, joining us online. And in-house, we have our panelists, CEO for Asia Pacific for a census, Eric Schaefer, and the head of the ecosystem for the MTR, Gene So. Please come on up to the stage. Thank you so very much. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Thanks and welcome. Good to see you again. Sorry I can't be there. Um, hey, Bernie, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, I'm, I'm in Christchurch. It's, it's okay. I can still hear you. <laughs> okay, good. You're traveling a lot this year, Bernie. Hey, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that the story? Once you, uh, once you get out of Hong Kong, you've got to stay up and get all your jobs done before you come home. <laughs> So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, this morning we're going to have a, uh, as I said, fireside chat talking about uh, innovation across borders. And for me, that's a really interesting subject. Uh, for those of you who might know me a little, so um, CPA from Australia, I spent 20 years in, 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 in Canberra as a kid. I spent 20 years in Sydney learning how to do things. And I've spent the last 20 years all over the planet doing stuff um, that's related to technology and real estate. So uh, um, really been a lot of fun, uh, been a part of four different startups. And uh, I think one of the greatest challenges of those startups was always, uh, certainly for two of them, was, was leaping across borders. So uh, of those four startups, two only ever stayed domestic in Australia, but two others we attempted to... Uh, go global or at least get out of Australia. And, uh, and that, that was really pretty interesting and pretty challenging. So uh, um, I understand some of the, the pain and frustration that, uh, that goes with that. And uh, I, I think, uh, again, our speakers today, um, so Gene and, and Eric, uh, both gentlemen I know, both gentlemen who've uh, got some battle scars and uh, have, have worked hard at uh, driving innovation and, and in, in their organizations and in the, in the industry, and, and also been successful in looking at how to, how to take that across the border in, into another country or even global. So um, I think the first thing I'd like to do, uh, Eric, if you just want to give us a minute or two, just a little bit about who you are, what you do, maybe some of the audience don't know. A little bit of your story, maybe. Sure, happy to. Uh, thanks, Bernie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as you've heard already, my name's Eric. I look after the Asia Pacific business for a census. Uh, in terms of story, maybe it's helpful to sort of share how I ended up here and, and started in, in prop tech. So I've always worked in, in commercial real estate. I've been on the investment side, the developer side, the operator side. And in all of my roles, uh, I sort of looked back on them and I thought, boy, most of those should uh, already be done by software or at least augmented by technology. And um, I also started to notice a bit of a disconnect in, in the industry around what customers are asking for, uh, where the customer demand is, and what the, the suppliers are offering the market, what the products are, and think that it's technology that, that really bridges that gap. So I joined a census uh, around a year and a half ago to launch the Asia Pacific business. Uh, we are uh, a 16 year old technology company focused on real estate. So you could say uh, doing prop tech since before it was prop tech. Uh, became a public company in 2019. Uh, but as I said, uh, began our journey to, to start up in Asia uh, last year. And uh, it's been an exciting time since then. Uh, we've opened offices uh, here, of course, uh, Singapore and Sydney and have seen uh, a lot of exciting growth. Wow, thanks. Thanks, interesting. And, and, and I think, Eric, uh, we'll come back to it, but I think a, a key part of that story is, is getting the business yeah, established across Asia uh, and across APEC. Uh, and, Jane, you, you've had a, a, a really interesting background. I, I look at your CV and say, well, started off with that sort of traditional um, 
engineering and then into the sort of the uh, the advisory and then into private equity and then really getting involved with uh, a whole bunch of different startups. Um, and and for me, you know, when I have had my experience in in Hong Kong, it's always been with the understanding that you know it's it's easy to start in one market but hard to really expand. So tell us a little bit about your your history. What's what's the story? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, like I guess my career date back to Silicon Valley days as an engineer uh, at a flash memory maker before switching to management consulting, and then actually last night's video announcement from Apple brings a lot of memories back because that actually is the time that device uh, basically made me cash the startup buck back when it was launched the very first time when Steve Jobs pulled it out. So, and I, thinking back, my very first startup uh, that I was, that worked on in 2008, it was a smartphone app to help people discover interesting retailers in a city. And these are not the retailers in like, you know, the big shopping malls where you, you see the same brands everywhere, but the more like the uh, hidden out of the view in the alleys or in the smaller, you know, side street, like St. Francis Yard in Hong Kong, you know, these kind of shops are the ones that, you know, my app was trying to bring attention to, you know, and, and, and that app was like a treasure, you know, hunting app, you know, where you can actually f discover interesting products and things like that. And thinking about that, right, um, the iPhone basically triggered me to be able to envision a future where these digital devices are able to connect, you know, property and real estate with people who may not be on that site, but attract them to go there. So the whole thing that kickstarted that idea of mine was that I saw, it was like 2008, right? Like the economy was going down. There was like, you know, financial crisis. There was a lot of sale going on, you know, on the streets. Uh, they, all these shops, they would put out signs. And, uh, but you know, you have to walk by to see it. But what if, you know, this device, you know, the iPhone or, you know, the smartphones today can tell you of what's going on even when you're not walking by, right? I think that, you know, really helps to drive my thinking change and see the possibilities what startups and innovative companies can do. And that is actually what led me back to Hong Kong to create the startup community. And then that actually led me on to work on, like, you know, a transport app, City Mapper. And then now I'm with MTL helping to drive innovation. Uh, so it's been quite a ride. And it's also, um, it, it also makes me think a lot about like, you know, what you know, um, new digital experiences can bring uh, to the built world. And uh, that's why you know, I'm always excited to talk about PropTech. Thank you, that's cool. And look, I'd, I'd agree. I think that some of the, you know, the things that really, um, I guess motivated me a few times with with startups was was the recognition of of the value of spatial data and and the ability to bring spatial data to the real estate industry. Um, way way back in around about two thousand, I was involved in a startup where we really were actually focused on that and trying to figure out how how to bring spatial data to the industry. And and I I think you know one of the things that that says to me is that over time. Now, back in 2000, when I when I was involved in that, uh, we were we were using really basic technology because smartphones didn't really exist back then. We were, you know, cell phones were still pretty basic. We were using alternative ways of identifying location-based data and building that into tools that we could provide to retail mall owners to drive you know, more targeted advertising. Um, and what happened is the smartphone completely broke that model. Um, we didn't see it coming. And sometimes that can be the story of innovation. Uh, even, even though I knew what Steve Jobs was doing, it still uh, blew things up a little. So, so Jane, right now, I mean, you're part of MTR. So that's really a Hong Kong-focused organisation in many respects. I know they, they have a broader reach than that. But uh, how, does, how, do, how does that feel as a challenge compared to trying to get a startup going? I mean, you're in a very different space here. What's, what's the value of that? Well, um, so my department, right, it's called Global Innovation Department uh, and MTL, and, you know, it was set about two and a half years ago to help drive innovation across 
the whole company, not just in Hong Kong, but also in other geographies like Sweden, UK, Australia, uh, China, Macau. And like, um, so I think the challenge, right, that is faced is like, how do I transform this business that has like a 40 plus year history into something that is, you know, um, that really like, you know, realizes the potential of the new world. You know, now we, of course, we are talking about Web3, you know, we, we talked about the smartphone, we talked about the di digital layers. How do you actually blend this, right, with, you know, MTL's famous like R plus P model, the real plus property model? I think there's a lot of opportunities still available to Hong Kong and, and, and you know, we want to be, you know, being headquartered out of Hong Kong, we want to show, you know, how the best infrastructure and experiences, you know, of transport in Hong Kong can be, you know, elevated to a whole other, you know, level with digital. Yeah. Okay. And and Eric, what made you choose Hong Kong? So we're a global business. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we tried to do when we were setting up here is think how can we take advantage of that? And Besides that, I was already in Hong Kong. You know, we looked at a lot of the key markets around the region, and you know, this is still the the center for real estate. This is where a lot of real estate decision makers sit. This is where a lot of new ideas are deployed, and has always been a gateway to the region. So it was a very sensible place for us to set up shop. Yeah, and and has that made it easier or harder to run the region, and and to really grow the business across the region? So shortly thereafter, we also set up uh, offices in Singapore and Sydney, and that was very much by design. Uh, the, the sort of challenges around travel notwithstanding, you know, one of the ways that we do sort of lean into or, or try and benefit from being global is that we have sight, line of sight into so many markets. And we can see what's going on um, in, in New York, in London, in, in Sydney, in Singapore. And from that, if you're really paying attention, you can start to um, see what trends are popping up elsewhere that are sort of inevitably going to come to the other markets. So you know, it was always by design that we would be um, having several hubs throughout the region. Mm -hmm. And what lessons have you learned? Uh, the value of face-to-face, -face, um, something I've been fortunate to be able to do over the last several months is, is be with a lot of our customers and uh, team members around the region, around the globe. And as a lot of the world sort of, and business communities start to sort of pick up that interaction again as, as travel opens in several places, um, just a reminder of, of how easy it is to sort of, or how much easier it is to get stuff done when, when you can be in person, um, as great as obviously Zoom is uh, mm. and seeing your face like this. Actually, yeah. On, yeah. On that note, on you know, value of face to face, right? Like, of course, we live in a very different world, you know, post COVID. Um, actually, even just last night, right? I was on the way back from work to home on an MTR, and like I was t chatting with on LinkedIn with someone in Taiwan, right? And uh, sh she said, like, hey, you know what? Let's hop on a quick call. Uh, she wanted to tell me an idea of something she's brewing with, like, you know. Uh, corporate ventures, and then you know we just immediately hop on the call, and then through the call it triggered another idea of, from me where I thought about a startup that I need to tell her about, because you know they are expanding into Taiwan, and you know and and of course you know and actually I've never met this person face to face ever before, <laughs> uh, but we feel like you know we've known each other for a long time, right? We have talked on LinkedIn. Uh, we, I've been on her her panel on Zoom. And like, uh, you know, it's pretty incredible. Um, but of course, you know, we, I can't wait to have one day be able to meet her face to face and also, you know, be able to exchange ideas and hopefully do some collaborations together. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think the lesson I've learned over the years about, uh, you know, either launching businesses across borders and or just running them is just lots of communication. Um, it, you can never over communicate realistically. And 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 Jean, from your perspective, as you've as you've been through you know sort of your career, what do you think when you think about 
startups and helping them or giving them some advice on how to you know break break down that first border and bridge that bridge that first state line and and build a business that's more than just one place advice experience what do you think so i i would for me i i guess my strength would be on like you know being a connector and also um listen carefully on what the startup has to offer and like how to help them do what they do better right so like you know i would tend to like try to think in their shoes right if i'm in their shoes what would be the best thing uh that i could you know help them with right like um i think that is one of the key things you know for for startups to kind of keep in mind and also for for myself to you know often think about like how i can help these founders um, to to connect like yesterday, I was I thought about a startup and and I and I and I helped to intro them uh, to this Taiwan contact um, to help them expand into other parts of Asia. Um, and on top of that, um, so you yeah, always think about helping first, and then you know the interesting thing these things are like karma; it comes back. Um, so you know people will think about oh you know what um, they might meet someone else and they'll. Rem- They'll, they'll tell that person, oh, you know what, Gene is the guy to talk to. So then I met meet another startup or like uh, an investor or so forth, and I, I would help to connect. And a lot of times when talking to these people, it actually uh, ignites you know some new ideas on my side or their side, and you know, and that's how I guess like you know partnerships or like interesting collaborations could come up, and I find that um, super amazing. And that's, I think, is what this whole new, you know, ecosystem and technology era is about. Yes. Eric, when you think about it, you know, someone who's a CEO of a startup focusing on, first of all, you know, finding that, that problem to solve that someone values, finding the money to help start the business, finding the team to build the product, and then realizing that the market's not big enough and you need to grow. Um, you, know, you you've been through some of those those challenges, but you've also worked in global businesses. What what what's your reflection on that? Well, I suppose, uh, and I'll keep it to sort of Asia Pacific context, right? Um, whenever you're thinking about go to market in this region, you know everyone knows how exciting uh, of a of a market it is if you can view it as one, um, and how much growth potential there is. But it's also an incredibly complicated part of the world to, to build a regional business in part because there's so much dynamism, there's many different countries, regulatory systems, cultures, languages. And when you, of course, look at it in aggregate, it's very attractive, but um, so, you know, each individual market can be small, especially if you're a technology business that relies on scale. Uh, so you know, when, when we, as we're still sort of growing, Obviously, you know, we know that some of the markets we've started in, Hong Kong and, and Singapore, are, are smaller markets. Um, but that was by design, right? Um, you, you sort of have to look, look ahead six months, 12 months, two years, on how are you going to use those markets to, to mature your product, to better localize it, to build the relationships and, and proof of concepts out for the region. Uh, but then grow uh, and, and expand to, the, to other markets, whether they be the mainland or, or Japan or India or, or some of the other places that offer real scale uh, is, is, is one of the key things, I think, uh, to take away having, having sort of done this a few times. Um, it's really important that you get your regional strategy right because it's, it's especially for a foreign business and newcomers to the region, that's, that's something that's very easy to get tripped up by. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I think one of the lessons that uh, we've learned uh, at our at my, in my organization at Yardi is is very much a, a an understanding which markets are the right markets to be in at the right time. Um, now, we we at our core, a big part of what we do is automate business process for real estate companies. And uh, to do that, you really, you know, in terms of bringing best practice process and you look at APAC and you look at 21 countries or thereabouts and, and uh, dealing with automating process across multiple languages, tax systems, regulatory systems, um, local practices, all that sort of stuff. 
and then saying, and, and with all of those languages, providing support for software. Uh, and, and where can you really get traction and, and get the most return for your efforts in terms of growing your business? And, and that taught us very much to look at markets where you know, the tipping point was really around, does, does this market and do, these, and do the main players in a market, do they value good business process? Is, is their solution to any business process problem uh, technology or is it throw people at the problem? Yeah. And uh, you know, that, that tells a story about the, how, how each of those markets mature and that sort of drives a lot of our focus in terms of where, where can we really help the most and get the most yeah. traction. And it's in markets where uh, the, the key players um, who are our, our, sort of our target clients, yeah. where they value good business process and see that technology is the right solution for solving those problems. And um, yeah, that then helps you understand where to go, what you've got to build in terms of infrastructure, because uh, what some people don't realize is from a software company's perspective, particularly when you, you get down into the sort of the accounting stuff and other business processes, it really is you know, very um, heavy support loads in some respects, because you've, you've got a lot of users, you've got a lot of processes, um, and, and making sure that users can, can use the system effectively. Uh, so making sure that you've, you've got support model right in the right languages uh, and investing in that infrastructure to build the, to build the platform that clients need. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of change this around a little and say, Jane, um, I want you to think about it. You've got a question for Eric, anything you think you'd like Eric to tell us about? Actually, um, yeah, good one. Actually, I do. <laughs> so, you know, um, Eric, so, you know, in a sense, is, you know, what you guys do as you help to enable all these, like, you know, real estate, you know, uh, landlords and, you know, property management companies to better serve their tenants. You know, how can, you know, from the landlord perspective, it's like, okay, so let's say if I use, you know, a census product, how can I actually build, like, you know, my own kind of IP on top of it, census, and 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 you know potentially you know add on to it. Sure. You know. How, how uh, well, uh, we're an open platform and built API first. So in terms of sort of integrating with other front ends or other sort of technologies that are already built, uh, that that sort of comes out of the box. But you know, I think the more interesting answer to that, and that we always try and encourage our customers and prospective customers to think about, is to to listen to their customers. Um, to make sure that they're they're seeing um, what their their tenants, their their visitors to their malls, to their offices, are asking for, um, because I think even over the last years we've seen a lot of uh, new business models spring up, or new takes on old business models. Take um, flexible work, for example, that are really just using technology and and, and other um, ways to fill a gap in the market. That's, that's, I think, not being met by, say, the traditional offering. So it really needs to be about the use case and, and what is the technology enabling. So you, know, you can build uh, almost anything these days, um, but is it going to be relevant for the business and for, for your customers and for the industry? Right. So I guess I, I could you know, relate that. Let's, let's say if I'm a traditional you know, property developer and like um, I'll be building this building, I'll be installing all these different hardwares and systems in the, inside the building, you know, before I can shape the experience of someone, you know, coming to my building and renting it, right? But now, I guess I have to take things to another level where, you know, um, not only do I have to install these, like, hardwares, but I have to think about, like, you know, how to shape the complete experience, because you know, I have a whole di another layer to kind of think about. Yeah, right. I mean, that's exactly what it's all about, right? Shaping that experience. I mean, you shared your anecdote earlier about how you remember the days when the iPhone came out and you're like, wow, this is going to change a lot. Right. And, it, and it has. If we think about, you know, how we all work now, it's entirely mobile. Uh, laptops and phones and, and a good connection are, are really all you need. Um, but has, say, you know, the world of office and the products that are offered caught up to that? Um, I'd say we're still we're still on that journey. So... Yes, um, every building, every market uh, is, is a bit different in the approach, uh, but ultimately it's about 
using these tools to, to get to that point. So, so how far do you think Hong Kong is from, you know, where you think like we can really be, like what, what would be your ideal kind of scenario in Hong, in Hong Kong? Uh, well, Hong Kong's far ahead of many places in, in many respects. And, you know, I think we heard earlier, you know, Asia Pacific um, lags behind other parts of the world in technology adoption. Uh, and obviously Hong Kong's included in that, but I, I see that if, if that's even true anymore, I question, and um, if it is, it's, it's that sort of window's rapidly closing because you know, I don't speak to many real estate stakeholders and leaders here that aren't thinking about technology, that aren't sort of at the forefront of you know, what can we do, what can we try? Um, and I think Hong Kong in particular can get a bad rap for that, and, and, and undeserved these days because um, most of the major developers and, and real estate operators here are quite forward thinking today. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so Eric, um, we're running out of time, but I'll give you a chance to ask a real quick question to Jim. Mm. While, while you think about that, I'll, 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 so, I'll, I'll tell the I've, audience that you know, you're talking about tools and the, and, and the and smartphones. Um, but some of us um, grew up in a day when we didn't have smartphones. We didn't even have mobile phones. When I first started work, if you wanted to call someone, you had to go back to your desk or find a public phone. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Gene, so obviously in your role, you see all types of uh, innovation, new ideas, new products, new technologies. That's, that's part of what you're meant to do to sort of look at and evaluate all that stuff. Uh, for for the audience's benefit, is there sort of a an area or specific part of prop tech um, that that you're most excited about, or that you're starting to see the 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 sort of more innovative solutions come come around? Yes, uh, actually, um, we are also looking heavily into it. <coughs> is how to improve the parking experience. Uh, it could be a residential, but probably more so in shopping malls and office buildings. I th we think that there is a lot that can be done to improve that. Um, and, um, and of course, you know, on top of that, um, EV charging as well. So uh, this is something that my team uh, is, is looking heavily into. Um, definitely, if there are any like, you know, startups listening in and uh, uh, are working on that, feel free to get in touch with me. And also on that note, um, I think one point I wanted to bring out is that, you know, in often in, in real estate space, we have architects, we have lots of designers designing, you know, great looking buildings and, and interiors. But I feel that in Hong Kong, sometimes I ha have a hard time finding designers to design for digital. Yeah. And I think that's very much needed um, for, um, yeah, you know, to, to take us to another level. I'll bring it back just to the sort of uh, title of the session, which is Innovation Across Borders. Yeah. So what would you say roughly is percentage of those ideas you're seeing that are homegrown or local versus those that are coming uh, across borders? Well, I mean, in, in terms of prop tech, you know, I think, you know, I don't see that many happening in Hong Kong. Okay. Probably 10, 10%, yeah. Uh, I have to well that that is an opportunity and of obviously we work with companies all over the world and like the whole idea is to how do you put all these different components together to shape the experience. Yeah, absolutely. And and look, I'd say it's enormously challenging, um, particularly in Hong Kong because you know you, it is a relatively small ecosystem. Um, but there, yeah, it's it's at the same time it's exciting because I mean for Gene, I think working in a a piece of infrastructure that is that is uh, definitely one of the best in the world in terms of what it does. Uh, great opportunity to really experiment with with new ideas. And listen, I think we're we're well and truly out of time. Um, I think, uh, but thanks, guys, and I hope the audience uh, enjoyed the enjoyed the session. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but Property Council New Zealand brought me here in 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 Christchurch, so. And I'd committed to that before I committed to this. But anyway, thanks anyway to to uh, to Paul and Leo and the team for for making this uh, this event possible and then making it hybrid, so we could uh, we more of us could enjoy it. Uh, thanks, guys, and uh, thank you.
Thank you very much to Bernie, Eric and Jean. If you could please stand for a photo. Strike a pose. Bernie's smiling in the background. <laughs> Fantastic, and if I could invite Leo and Paul also to the stage for a photo, please. You get a photo each time, yes. <laughs> this is fantastic, Bonnie, Bonnie's photoshopped in the background. <laughs> <laughs> 